Richard, how did you enjoy the event and what were the highlights for you? Uh, it's been a fantastic event. It's been great to uh, join the delegation, uh, showcasing some of the best uh, technology Israel has to offer and uh, particularly uh, meeting so many interesting investors uh, and ecosystem around uh, customers who really want to take advantage of uh, the vibrant technology that we have. Tell me about Biocatch. Uh, Biocatch is a cognitive behavioural biometric company. Uh, we use this technology to help our customers authenticate their users and uh, protect their users from fraud uh, and uh, malware detection. Um, we've started in Israel. We've seen that our technology is working very well. We're working today with most of the uh, commercial banks, telcos, retailers. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've started slowly going outside of Israel in order to check the ground, see if it's our technology working also outside of Israel. And the next step for sure will be booming out and you know taking the world. The main difference is that Israel is a very small market, so we uh, are better side with uh, uh, the large banks, uh, but there's only two large banks in Israel. So basically we better uh, our products in, uh, in Israel and then we're looking to expand globally. And I think the UK as a financial center is uh, the best place for us uh, to expand because it's uh, one of the biggest markets uh, uh, that you can imagine for fintech companies. So when we're ready, we come to the UK. It's a great opportunity, you know, to, to meet people, to meet customers, to meet other uh, uh, companies, uh, to meet investors, to meet uh, people that we are interested to hear what they think about us. And, and of course, uh, opportunities uh, for investment, opportunity for mainly working with the uh, customers here in the UK. So for us, that's the highlight of the evening. Ladies, gentlemen, the future ambassador to Israel, who I've just met. Welcome to Mazars. We're extremely pleased you've, uh, you've all come here. We've already met the delegation and we've already welcomed our Israeli friends. Um, just to say once again, um, Mazars has a very strong team out in Israel. Um, we're a global firm, we're very pleased to be here, and we've done a lot of work in the fintech sector. But we're not here to advertise Mazars, just to welcome you. Um, and I'd like to welcome our co-sponsor, um, Eddie George from New Finance, who may want to say a few words, and then we're going to introduce you to some other people. Thanks. Thank you for coming. This is a joint event with the UK Israel Tech Hub and Mazars. Um, I won't take too long. I think it's a really interesting event to have a showcase of, of fintech entrepreneurs. That's a thing we support. Um, and I hope you find that really interesting. And I won't take any more of his time. Thank you. There you go. Now I'm going to hand you over to a young lady who's going to do much more than me. Take your mic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Naomi krieger Carmi. I'm the director of the UK Israel Tech Hub. Uh, I want to thank Gerald and Gabriel and the entire Mazars team, as well as Eddie and the New Finance uh, Organization for partnering with us tonight on this event. Um, we're very excited to see such a crowd. I really want to extend a, a very warm welcome to David Quarry, who, as mentioned, will be taking up his post this summer. Um, it's really great to be in London. The weather is perfect as always. Um, and we're wrapping up a few very busy days um, with 14 exciting Israeli entrepreneurs in the fintech space. Um, tomorrow, some of you may know, is the uh, Jewish holiday of Purim. That's uh, our equivalent to uh, Halloween, where we have fancy dress. So tonight we have 14 entrepreneurs masquerading as accountants in uh, suits and ties. Um, this is the, a very unique moment that you'll get to see them this way um, in their natural habitat. They look uh, quite different. Um, so thanks to our entrepreneurs for humoring us uh, with our dress code request. <laughs> 
Um, just before we start, I just want to say a, a special word of thanks um, to the Hub team who've really uh, worked very hard on this project, um, to Ayelet, our Deputy Director here in London, to Anna, our associate here who works with her, and, and above all to, to Avi Cohen, who's our Digital Solutions Manager, and has really put this project together from start to finish. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to invite up Chaim to tell us a little bit about the Israeli ecosystem. Okay, uh, good evening. Everyone gave a short introduction, so I'm going to give a very long presentation in order to balance. So in the next hour or so, no. Uh, so I'm Chaim Shani. I'm the chairman of the Israel-UK Tech Hub. Uh, in my day job, I'm a co-founder and general partner of uh, Israeli private equity by the name of Israel Growth Partners, uh, which focuses on the growth stage of the Israeli uh, tech uh, companies. Prior to that, I was uh, permanent secretary of the Israeli Ministry of Finance, and I've spent uh, almost 30 years uh, prior to that working for the Israeli and global tech scene. My last position was CEO of uh, Nice Systems, which is one of the top software companies uh, coming out of Israel. So the Tech Hub started a few years ago by a letter which was uh, sent from uh, Prime Minister David Cameron to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, basically suggesting that uh, some sort of cooperation between the two countries will be formed specifically around the tech sector. This, this is how it started. And uh, Ambassador Matthew Gould, the present uh, UK ambassador to Israel, uh, has basically initiated or taken this idea and made out of it a very concrete, uh, if you would like, uh, operation that is now uh, operating in Israel. It is led by, uh, by uh, Nomi Krieger, uh, and the objective is to drive economic growth and cooperation between the two countries. And the main reason behind this cooperation is the fact that the high-tech scene in Israel, or the high-tech economy, makes close to 15% of the country's GDP. It is the major contributor to the country's uh, current account balance, and uh, it has produced significant innovation. It has contributed to the success of many global companies that have worked and operated in Israel. For example, <coughs> Intel used to derive almost 20% of its profit from an engineering center that they have uh, near Haifa with few thousand engineers. The country has a very strong, if you would like, academic infrastructure, which uh, produced uh, the second in terms of the number of academic degrees per population, per person. It's the second in the world. Uh, almost every Israeli startup that is looking to build his corporation or his operation immediately think global. There's no home market. So unlike a company that could uh, developed in, uh, in the Midwest and reach a hundred million dollars and still the furthest the entrepreneur would go would be to uh, New York or, uh, or the Silicon Valley. Israeli entrepreneurs from day one, even when they have just the idea on a PowerPoint, they immediately think global and global market and global perspective. So there are many ingredients that made uh, the success of the tech sector as it is today. So we assume that all those factors have uh, been part of the idea to cooperate between uh, the, two, the two economies. Uh, the challenge was, when uh, the hub started, is the fact that when one thinks of cooperation in the tech sector, what immediately comes to mind are names like Google, Microsoft, uh, Intel, uh, Motorola, and others. And the UK actually does not have this type of big tech focus. So what the Hub team has done, it had actually looked at the different sectors that are strong and are flourishing uh, in the UK. It looked at areas where the Israeli economy and the Israeli tech sector can contribute, and we have mapped, if you like, the team has mapped those areas where some sort of government intervention or public, public organization could trigger and could encourage the market to cooperate. So we have looked at areas such as the uh, um, pharmaceutical area, areas like the e-commerce, where it is a very developed market, or, or very developed uh, here in the UK, the media, of course, 
connections and relationship with the Arab world, the strengths of the engineering teams or engineering companies here in the UK, which can collaborate with Israeli tech startups in water, water desalination, water technology, and so on. And of course, one of the most important areas with London being one of the most important, if not the most important financial center in the world, uh, we felt that this is a sector where collaboration between the financial <coughs> center, the ambitious, the objective of the UK government to continue and innovate and innovation coming out of Israel could be a very good way to partner. And this tech exchange program is an example of the things that the hub does with a team of a few people organizing, driving, uh, um, organizing mission, bespoke visits, tech exchange uh, delegation, and stuff like that. This is the way that we form collaboration between companies and tech companies in Israel and enterprises here in the UK. So uh, if uh, one would consider and one would look how actually, what are the ways to cooperate with the different uh, type of companies or the different, different <coughs> ways to collaborate uh, uh, with the Israeli tech scene, it could range from uh, direct investment through uh, M&A, uh, R&D centers, there are some government programs, there are academic corporations. For, so for example, a GSK has uh, signed a collaboration agreement with the Technion, and hopefully uh, they will have a, one day a blockbuster contributing both to the UK economy and to the Israeli economy. Who knows, because this is obviously an investment that uh, will take a long time to materialize. So there are different ways to partner uh, with the, uh, with the um, ecosystem. And here are some logos of companies that, uh, that have done that. Uh, in terms of the FinTech specifically, there are various ways to collaborate. One specific example is the Citibank uh, operation, Citibank Innovation Center. Typically, both US and UK companies go, when they go outside of London, they would go to Bangalore or they would go to, uh, to Poland or to Eastern Europe. Uh, but when looking at the challenges of the financial world, looking at the disrupting forces, the need for innovative technology in very fast supercomputers, a semiconductor, uh, in sophisticated algorithms and analytics, those type of talent could be found in the country. And this is exactly what City has done. They've opened their innovation center and around it built an, in, um, an ecosystem, an accelerator. And actually some of the companies here have graduated from the City Accelerator, accelerator uh, in, uh, in Tel Aviv. So uh, we look forward that this is going to be a, a great uh, event tonight. And uh, I will hand over to Avi. Where is Avi? We will share with you a little bit more specifics about the Israeli uh, fintech scene. <coughs> Thank you and have a great night. And good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be here and uh, to take part of this uh, great mission. And I would like to thank the UK Hub for organizing that and our hosts here in London for actually welcoming us and uh, startup companies that uh, actually were part of this mission for the efforts and their participation in the mission. So I believe it has been very successful. So by way of a background, I don't know if I should define myself as a FinTech veteran or FinTech enthusiastic. I would rather be FinTech enthusiastic. I've been in this FinTech space now for over 35 years, started as entrepreneur and CEO of an Israeli FinTech company and gradually transitioned to become an investor, and I'm a co-founder of Carmel Ventures and the Viola Group. Carmel is an early stage IT-focused fund uh, with over $800 million under management, and the Viola is a much larger technology-focused private equity group. And I lead, uh, I lead the fintech practice in Carmel, and uh, we do both uh, pure play fintech companies as well as many of our companies are selling uh, uh, our major part of the revenues is being sold to financial institution, and we were fortunate enough also to be backed by financial services uh, investors. So we've been in this space now for many years, and uh, we also run a fintech forum, which runs once a quarter around uh, different topics that are relevant for the fintech uh, industry in Israel. 
I believe that all of us are aware of uh, the disruption that this market is going under. I believe the banks still enjoy a lot of the consumer trust, but uh, most of their revenues are under threat due to the digital competitors and new emerging competitors coming to the market, so they better do something about that. We as consumers are definitely defining the agenda of those banks. We want the same type of service we get from the Facebooks, the Googles, and the Amazons of the world. And we would like that to be immediate, personalized, and uh, when you have regulators and legislators on one hand and consumer on the other hand, then definitely there's room for disruption. It's a perfect storm for actually startup companies to leverage on and actually create new innovative ideas that will either solve those challenges or disrupt the existing financial services system. So I believe under this uh, general background, I believe Israel actually enjoys a great uh, opportunity here and uh, I would like to definitely share with you why we believe Israel can play a very significant role in this global fintech scene. So first of all, I'm sure most of you know about uh, the innovative nature and the entrepreneurial nature of Israel. Uh, over 800 new companies are being formed every year and uh, the Israeli startup nation has been uh, known for its uh, entrepreneurial culture. And this has been backed in the last 20 years by a very sophisticated investor ecosystem. Everything from seed investors to venture capitalists to growth equity players. So this actually enables those bright entrepreneurs and great companies to get the funding required to actually create category leaders in respective places, including the financial services place. As you can tell from this slide, uh, most of the money that is in being invested in Israel is actually being invested by non-Israeli private equity players. So the Israeli players uh, account for only 25% of the money invested in Israel, and 75% of the money invested in Israeli startup companies comes from international investors from all over the world mostly from the United States and the Silicon Valley, but also from Europe and recently also from the Far East. And uh, I believe this is a very strong testimony to the quality of the companies that are being uh, built out of Israel. I believe that uh, Israel is also known for a very fundamental technology expertise and some of the technologies that have been developed in Israel like uh, online uh, trading, uh, big data analytics, uh, real-time uh, processing, video processing and many, many security and cyber security that actually originated from military and surveillance uh, application back uh, years ago, but have been adapted recently to two main industries, the online marketing industry, and actually today we have announced that one of our portfolio company, which is a big data company in the marketing, online marketing space, was acquired by Nielsen. So definitely online marketing and then financial services have been two areas where Israeli entrepreneurs have adapted those fundamental technologies into emerging market needs that have to do with providing you the specific service at a specific point of time on a personalized level. Personalized level. And in the last few years, we have also actually developed a very strong consumer-oriented knowledge in Israel, companies like Waze and many, many others. So coupling those fundamental technologies with, I believe, a better understanding and what consumers are looking for to be serviced, uh, I believe that's a very strong fundamental for creating a very strong fintech related industry. And uh, the other thing is that in the last 20 years we have created also a legacy. In the last 20 years you see here names of companies that emerge as leaders in their respective niches, category leaders from operational risk management to surveillance, to security, to personal financial management. Some of them went public. Most of them were acquired by leaders of the industry, but this has created a very strong fintech sector. So we have, first and foremost, a very deep understanding of what does it take to sell to financial services organization. Then we start to see a very important factor in the ability to create category leaders is second timers coming to the market. People that have already 
built companies to hundreds of millions of dollars of revenues, either sold them or took them public and are coming back to the market to really make something even more impactful, even more big than that. And we all know in our industry that second timers, as well as first timers, the Zuckerbergs of the world, are very important in this ecosystem to create substantial company. So we have a sector knowledge, we have second timers, we have the understanding of the go-to market and what does it take to build a fintech grade company that needs to survive and answer those demanding requests for the financial services uh, industry and I believe that's a very strong setting to the industry. We also have a very strong local fintech uh, system. First of all, the Israeli financial institution, both the banks and the credit card companies are very receptive of innovation, have been like that in the last 30 years, and recently all of them have opened uh, very strong innovation centers that both help young startup companies to navigate through the banks, but also are very knowledgeable of what's going on in the world and can actually serve as gatekeepers and gateways for the Israeli startup companies to understand what is the competitive landscape in the world. So I always recommend to startup companies to do their better sites in Israel and then to go globally. As Chaim said, all of our companies are very global from the very first day. We have a very small local market, so we cannot actually build companies just from the Israeli market. Then the Israeli entrepreneurial innovation scene has attracted many, many companies like Citibank and Barclays to open innovation centers. And some of the fintech focused companies like Intuit and Sagard and RSA do have large, very large, and eBay have very large uh, development centers in Israel. Most of them started through an acquisition of Israeli companies, but uh, have grown up to become very significant part of the operation. And then we have a very experienced investor base and definitely a lot of activities, meetups, conferences. So I believe every other day there is another fintech related activity. So I believe this sharing of experiences and the local scene is a very good background for the Israeli companies to build their initial product and then go global. This has also resulted in increasing investment in this space. As you can see, about 50 new companies, pure fintech related companies. I'm not talking about security related companies or other infrastructure players that may sell also to financial services organization. I'm talking about pure play companies that are providing some sort of financial services either to the financial services organization or competing with the financial services. So around 50 new companies are being formed every every year. We have hundreds of them these days and Stuart who is in charge of the Israeli city incubator told me that the last applicant list was over 100 companies that applied for the accelerator of city for this uh, coming uh, accelerator round. So I believe it's a growing number of industries, uh, companies and also the money invested is growing. Over 10% of the venture capital money invested in Israel goes to pure play players. We are now at a pace of $3.4 billion a year. That was the money invested last year, and we also had a very successful exit year, $5 billion in exits, M&A, and over $9 billion in IPO value. And the, last, the first two months of the year, until to date, we are close to $2 billion. So we hope that 2015 will be even better year for the Israeli venture industry. Now, the companies that are being formed in Israel actually play across all sectors, you know, from the payment space, everything from cross-border payments, to point of sale, to payment splitting, and many, many others. You are going to see some of them today. Uh, definitely customer engagement, personal financial management is a big area in Israel. Again, combining big data analytics with consumer understanding. So many, many companies in this space. The SMB target market has attracted uh, many new initiatives, mainly around lending. So we have seen um, about six companies emerging out of Israel actually targeting the online lending for small businesses. And again, using very strong uh, analytics to both do risk scoring as well as customer acquisition. And uh, some of them are very successful. Trading has always been very successful in Israel. Started with you know algo trading and foreign exchange trading and retail trading, but also institutional trading. So we have a lot of knowledge in this space not to say cyber security and fraud prevention, many, many companies in this space from payments fraud to merchants fraud to many, many other applications, definitely banking infrastructure. 
So to sum up, I believe we have a very strong fintech industry in Israel. It's very global. It understands what does it take to service uh, very demanding financial services institution, very capable entrepreneurial team and executive team. And this has attracted actually a lot of money to Israel and has generated and is going to generate, I believe, many more category leaders in the respective spaces. So we are going to see kind of tip of the iceberg of this scene in Israel. And hopefully it will be interesting enough to actually make you come and visit us in Israel and we'll be more than willing, we and the hub and all the players in the ecosystem to host you in Israel and to find other ways of cooperation. Thank you. Okay, the moment you've all been waiting for. Uh, we'll start with the first company, uh, Offer. Please come to the stage. Offer from Authentix. Hi. Do you know what's the major cause of customer loss in customer acquisition online and mobile? Well, typically it's basically the onboarding process. In the onboarding process. The first thing that has to be done by mandated regulations is that the customer needs to submit his ID in order to authenticate his uh, details and use it for the next uh, phases of the process. Until now, if you have been applying to an account or whatever online for an, in a uh, financial service, uh, you would probably fill in some data on the website or on your mobile phone. You would probably take a photo of your ID and then send it over to the system out there at the back office. At that point, automation stops. All those pictures are being basically viewed by people in some back office that are sitting there for nine, nine hour shifts and having to make sense out of documents that, that can come over from any, any country in the world, including passport, driving licenses, etc., etc. This stops the process, this holds customer onboarding, this causes fraud and this causes regulatory problems. What we have done is basically uh, put on the market the first viable completely automated system that simply gets a picture, it knows what's in the picture, which document it is, it can authenticate it up to the level of knowing if a software even touched it, if all the uh, bits of the picture are correct, even where in the world it was taken, and this is probably the deepest level that one picture taken by a client at home or somewhere can tell you about the customer. Now, all of this process, identifying the picture, authenticating the picture, getting the data out of it and streaming it to the next level, takes eight to 10 seconds. Your only alternative today is either do it manually, it will take you something between two minutes up to uh, hours and even more than that, depending on your process, or you have conventional solutions that are basically template matching, that's the old way, which replicates front-end to online, which doesn't work because it's completely different. So what we are basically providing is a new way to onboard customers online and mobile, which is called secure customer onboarding. We are fast tracking both KYC and the process of creating the records and streaming the, the customer into the system. Okay, two in one, KYC onboarding, eight seconds for the first time, and just uh, a bit name dropping, uh, this is the system that's now have been adopted by Google. We're hoping that the end of the quarter by PayPal. So this is the magnitude of companies who need such a technology basically to open up the pipeline to do more business. Thank you. We can have Richard from BioCat. Hello. Uh, my name is Richard Perry. I'm a VP Amir for Biocatch. And uh, Biocatch is a cognitive behavioral biometric company. Yes, I know that sounds a little intense. Um, effectively, what we are looking to do is analyze the interactions of uh, our customers, financial institutions, perhaps enterprises or e-commerce organizations, when their users are online, either via web or via uh, mobile applications. And we do that by analyzing the physical attributes of the users, the cognitive attributes of the users, and the behavioral context upon which they use a device. So we can use that uh, technology in order to 
uh, reduce the friction that's often associated with authentication and reduce the fraud that uh, our customers receive from uh, malware or malicious activity. And I thought I'd just try and give you a brief insight into what that really means. And you can think about this perhaps next time you pick up a device. But here's my iPad. Nothing new here. Next time you pick up a device, think about how you hold it. I know since I've been working at Biocatch, I generally hold my device in a landscape uh, size and my left hand, and I scroll with my right hand. Now, I'm a little bit nervous because uh, you guys are all quite new and let's be honest, the room is quite warm. So I probably maybe have a little shake, a small tremor. Now, perhaps I hit the device really hard when I type. I haven't been to the gym for a while. So uh, some people will be taller, some people will be shorter, some people will be left-handed, right-handed. And all of these um, choices, the way we hold our device, perhaps we hold it upright, perhaps we um, uh, use different choices on our keyboard and mouse interactions, all of these will be some of the 400 behavioral um, contexts, parameters that we assess in order to authenticate and protect our users from fraud. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Gideon from Coin Sciences. Hi, I'm Gideon Greenspan, founder and CEO of Coin Sciences. As you can probably hear I'm actually from the UK, but I moved to Israel 15 years ago to do a PhD. Met a girl and ended up staying, so that's why I have this confusion for you. So, blockchains are the technology which underlies the Bitcoin network. Um, and the Bitcoin network enables people to transact with each other in a peer-to-peer -peer basis without a central authority and without an intermediary. And what we've done is we've taken the blockchain technology out of Bitcoin and packaged it up in a way which makes it very suitable for financial institutions. Because financial institutions are starting to experiment with this technology. They can see that it creates a way for them to do trading and settlement much more cheaply, quickly, and without intermediaries. So we've kind of packaged it up for them in a way that makes it easy for them to use the technology. Because it's quite highly specialized and quite difficult for them to do themselves. We've also extended blockchain technology in two ways. Number one, we've enabled the creation of private networks. So it's very important to financial institutions that if they're creating a network for moving money around, that's not open to the whole internet. And the second way in which we've uh, enhanced it is created multi-currency blockchains that enables financial institutions to create systems which trade and transact between different types of financial instruments on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So if you're working for a financial institution which is looking in this area, or if you're serving financial institutions and you're starting to hear about blockchains, and you need some help on the technical front to build on some platform that already exists rather than do everything yourselves, I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Itai from Bali, and then uh, Ori from CoreView. Hi, I'm Itai from Bonit. I'm the CEO and founder of the company. We have built a data-driven platform for, for bond portfolio management. Fixed income is the biggest market by far in the financial world. It's also the, more, the less sophisticated one. We provide a new alternative for managing fixed income portfolios. We provide online cloud-based platform for, for managing entire universal bond portfolio. We provide the user full set of constraints and parameters in order to build a full optimized portfolio. And we also uh, support the full life cycle of the portfolio. Thank you very much. Ori from CoreView. Hi, Ori from CoreView. Ours is uh, really simple. It's a call and a view combined, meaning next time you take your phone and call a company, you're going to hear what they have to say, options, information, but also be able to see it. That's pretty much the story. Uh, we've graduated the Citibank Accelerator uh, second wave in, uh, in Israel, had the MasterCard Innovation Award and the Credit Suisse uh, Startup Award, for example. And the reason is probably that we aim uh, towards solving uh, quite um, familiar uh, large pain point of making phone calls to businesses. So combining the digital world with a plain phone call is, is pretty much our claim for fame. Thank you. Thank you. Yoav. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Yoav Schreiber, co-founder and CEO of Clarisite. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Clarisite is a powerful big data behavioral analytics solution for the web and mobile. It records, replay, replays and analyzes customer behavior without the cost and complexity of conventional solutions. While conventional, conventional solutions takes weeks 
to generate new reports and requires specialist IT involvement, Clarisite enables the business owner to generate reports instantly and realize the benefit in seconds. So it's weeks for conventional solutions versus seconds using Clarisite uh, uh, solution. And this is thanks to several technology break breakthroughs and, and different, completely different concept of collecting the data. Uh, thanks to this, our clients significant, significantly increased the conversion ratios and increased the revenues from lost transactions, improved customer experience. Uh, we have today large enterprises from the financial sector as customers. Our clients, our clients include Lomi Bank, Discount Bank, AXA, Global Direct Insurance, uh, Clan Insurance, uh, and many more companies. Um, our solution, Clarisite offers both a cloud solution and on-premise solution. For both for the both alternatives, the implementation is, is, is implemented in just a few days. Uh, I would like to quote the C CTO of Lomi Bank, this one of the two largest banks in Israel. He said that Clarisite is the best decision that the bank made during the past year. He doesn't remember any other solution that, at this scale that become to be such, such strategic to the bank that uh, was implemented so fast and so successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Av, and we're going to move forward to Tal from Finovest. Well, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tal. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, uh, Finovest. Uh, Finovest is using mobile devices to fundamentally change the way that investment advisors interact with their clients. We enable advisors to overcome their biggest challenge when working with non-discretionary accounts, and it's the fact that they can only advise and execute trading orders to one client at a time. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, advisors are professional. They are supported with research department and investment experts and the most advanced tools to monitor global markets, yet they have no ability to transfer their expertise in real time to multiple clients. And even if they had the chance to uh, disseminate their advice to 10% of their clients, a lack of mass execution platform will create a bottleneck of trading orders that the advisor will never be able to manually execute on time. <clears throat> what Finovest is doing, we offer uh, banks, IFAs, and brokerage uh, firms is uh, uh, a platform that enables uh, advisors to generate and disseminate uh, personalized investment advice to numerous clients simultaneously, while it's enabling end clients to receive directly to their mobile device a tailored recommendation and to authorize and execute automatically the multiple uh, trade orders directly through the uh, uh, exchange. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Shamir? Hi, hello everybody. My name is Shamir Segal and I'm the CEO of GSTAT Software Solutions. We develop some exciting big data predictive analytics technology. Our technology helps financial institutes and other B2C companies like telcos and retailers to actually maximize the revenues from their customers through personalized next best action and retention recommendations. So what we do, we take the big data these companies have on their customers on one hand, and the big data they have on the different products, actions, promotions they have on the other hand, and then we use some advanced and complex um, machine learning based algorithms and processes in order to optimally match the best offer, promotion, action to each customer. So we run hundreds of predictive analytics models in our platform. I should say that today, um, a similar process uh, that banks want to do using existing technology requires them a manual, a massive manual work of data scientists uh, and actually takes them uh, many years perhaps. So we don't only reduce the time to results from many months to hours, we also show our customers that we can improve the, their campaign's performance. So we actually improve the targeting by up to 50%. That means that our customers are able to sell up to 50% more credit cards, loans, mortgages, insurance products, or any other financial product using our technology. And I'll be glad to share with you more information and uh, business cases later on. Thanks. Thank you. And now, followed by that, we'll hear from Pay It Simple. Hi, good evening. Um, 
the thing I love about Europe is you have to practice uh, doing business while drinking drinking wine. Um, it's not part of my speech. It's it's plain honesty. Uh, so excuse me for any any mistake I'll I'll, I'll do. Um, I wasn't uh, uh, an, emp an entrepreneur all of my life. I've been uh, uh, a life coach for 10 years, and I realized uh, two things about people. Um, most of us are easily get lost, and the second thing, that we don't like to be alone. Uh, for the past 10 years, social media fixed this, the second thing. We no longer feel uh, alone. Uh, but the thing is that we're still being overwhelmed by uh, content, by information and by uh, product. And what more of us, uh, uh, what we did in, in more of us, along with my uh, uh, partner, Menashe Gezelkopi, we created a platform that enables any uh, uh, financial service or bank uh, to create ways of content inside uh, the website, which means that I'm as a customer is able to go in into your website, into a bank website or a mobile app and see financial uh, uh, planning uh, journeys, um, any kind of, of complex uh, uh, financial, ser uh, financial journey being simplified and I'm as a customer is engaged using personalized uh, content and personalized um, uh, product offering. Uh, being a new investor, planning my mortgage, everything is being uh, um, uh, engaged inside your uh, inside your website, which means that the customer won't see the bank only as a bucket of uh, his deposit, but will see the bank as a true in, uh, uh, true partner for his uh, financial planning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alon, and then we'll hear from uh, Dudi from Personetics. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. My name is Alon, uh, and I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of Paid Simple. Uh, I've served for more than 15 years in the credit card industry, uh, both in Brazil and Israel, in uh, senior positions and uh, leading companies in this area. And um, <clears throat> Paid Simple uh, actually is a, a very uh, innovative and most effective way to give uh, instant consumer credit at the point of sale using the existing credit card of the customer. <coughs> so our cloud-based uh, patented solution uh, actually uh, helps the merchants to split uh, any purchase of their customers into interest-free installments. And this is uh, uh, due to the technology that actually uses the available credit line that the customers doesn't use on a daily basis to become a collateral for a, a recurring uh, capture of the installments without carrying any interest for the customer. So this is very attractive both for the customers and can create an increase of double-digit numbers for the merchants on sales. <clears throat> Our service is actually uh, a, a, enable any customer that holds a MasterCard or Visa card to split uh, the, the high ticket purchases into those interest free installments. Uh, our solution is currently being uh, uh, used uh, both in brick and mortar and uh, e commerce uh, merchants. And uh, we operate already in the US. Uh, we have some clients over there. And uh, we are uh, very proud to be invited by Visa to, to run a pilot here in the UK. Uh, just uh, to, to uh, give you a notion of, of the potential of the, US, uh, of the UK market, there are almost 200 billion pounds of credit card uh, credit lines that are not in use in any each moment here in this country. So there is a potential for uh, this uh, product uh, also here in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alon. Now, Person Ethics. Hi, uh, my name is David Sosna, and I'm uh, a co-founder in Person Ethics. Uh, we are helping uh, today some of the largest uh, banks in the world, mainly in North America, to get personalized and build trust with their customers. So most of you do not go to the branches anymore, and basically banks uh, lost the touch with you. They lost their ability to talk to you on a one-to-one -one basis. And now they're fighting to get your attention. You, you, you spend time in the bank's website, then you go to Amazon, then you go to others. How do they engage you? 
So they have been doing some great things. They have been developing personal ads that you know you you get presented when you go in. How many people remember that? How many people click on it? Not not very much. They also have these you know sets of services. How many of you actually took cash out by you know taking the mobile phone and plugging it next to the ATM? Again, very few. The idea, the problem is about engaging and guiding the consumer. What Personetics does, Personetics is able to generate insights that are targeted, personalized, and are not focusing on sales. They are focusing on what is relevant to the customer at this point in time. It's about the paycheck that just arrived for a certain customer, and that customer usually pays his bills immediately after the paycheck has been deposited to the account, and we can actually let him know that that thing is happening. We can more warn another customer about a duplicate charge, or perhaps a renewal that just popped after three months. You know, when you sign up to this magazine, they say, oh, it's all for free, and then after three months, boom, they pop the charge, and uh, you know, you have to actually try to resolve that. It's about recommending a customer that is, meeting, that is making sporadic payments to a saving account about using the Save to Gold program that each bank has today, but very few customers are using. Or just provide positive pat on the back to customers that are going great on their saving. We are able to do it by looking at very simple sets of data. And the other thing that we're doing very well, we're developing the, these insights in our R&D center and testing it with banks all around the world, in North America, Mexico, Argentina, Israel, Switzerland, and more recently in the UK. The result of our work is that banks can now connect to their customers in mobile, on the web, with push, and the results are also measured by number of products that customers are using, number of services, transaction migration, and of course, Net Promoter Score, which is a fancy name for customer satisfaction. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And last but not least, Lior from Tetaray. Our purpose in Tetaray is to transform the way the world benefits from data. And we do it one industry at a time. We started with the critical infrastructure industry, and uh, General Electric is one of our customers. And now in the recent few months, we were focused on the financial services industry. And what we do there, we do a cyber security and um, fraud detection. And how do we do it? We use big data analytics technology developed by two distinguished professors, one from Tel Aviv University and one from Yale University. And the idea there is that we're not using any rules or patterns or behaviors. It's rule-free, it's machine learning, totally automated, no need to configure and no need to maintain. I would like to share with you an example of a trial that we've done in a large bank in the Netherlands last month. We were receiving data for SMB loans, and within 15 seconds that the algorithm has run, we found 2 million euros of fraud. For the analyst in the bank and the forensic teams, it took nine months to do it manually. So imagine what would happen if we were installed there at the time that the fraud uh, took place, and if we are installed 24 by 7 in the bank. I would be happy to share with you more examples of what we do and the benefit that we provide. So come to talk to me later. Well, thank you. Thank you, Leo. Back to Naomi. Okay, thank you. Um, so you've all gotten to know our companies, and I just want to uh, say for those who don't know, these are companies that were chosen through a pretty rigorous competitive process that we ran um, in Israel and with uh, colleagues here in the UK from major financial institutions helping us select the ones that uh, are most interesting and relevant. Um, but now the companies really want to get to know you. Um, and I want to pick up on two themes that we heard before uh, from Chazi, uh, two things we now know about people. People easily get lost and people don't like to be alone. Um, so we've tried to solve the first problem by putting up uh, clear signs outside uh, where each company is located so you can easily navigate and find them. Um, but the second one is really up to you. So we don't want anyone to be alone. Um, let's keep the, the flow going. Um, I hope you'll all get to meet as many um, of each other as possible. The companies are really eager to meet you. I want to thank again our uh, hosts and sponsors for tonight, Mazars and New Finance, um, and invite everyone to go outside and start uh, interacting. Thank you.